So we've got a medical doctor, a PhD doctor, and a, a son of a doctor. <laughs> oh. But Lou, we know you know as much as doctors. So uh, somebody out there can yeah, start us off. Maybe this gentleman. Is this on? Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. Something uh, that I I'm, – yeah, I'm Bill Anderson uh, and I uh, teach at, uh, economics at Frostburg State University in Maryland. And Bill's, Bill's one of our affiliated scholars with but, Mises. Um, something that I, I think to go along with it, it's more like of a comment, but I'd like to see how you, you respond, and that is that – not only are we seeing this growth of a police state and the imprisonment, but the law itself has undergone, I guess, a, rev- a bit of a revolution. And that is that in the past, especially in criminal law, we, we had what we called malum and se uh, directing our law. And that was that an act was bad. Um, and it was understood universally to be bad. I mean, you know, societies throughout history have had laws against murder and, and, and rape and, and uh, theft and the like. But now what we have is a growth of malum a prohibitum, and that is that the government just sets a bunch of rules. They have arbitrary numbers and targets and the like. And if you violate that... Then you go to prison. I mean, if, you know, we can talk about our, you know, metastasizing prison system, but it would not have been possible without this legal revolution because well over half of the people in, uh, in prison today, in American prisons, are there for what we would call violations of malum prohibitum. In other words, they, they broke a rule as opposed to what we would call, say, uh, committed a crime historically. Now, that's my thinking, but I would like to know how, how the panel would uh, look at that particular comment. Did either of you want to start? Well, so the general question, if anybody didn't hear it, was basically the distinction in law between acts that have always been known to be harmful to others and ethically, morally, they've always been looked down on, as opposed to acts that are victimless in a sense, but they're just prohibited by the state. And, and as Dr. Anderson pointed out, a, a huge number of, of our jailed criminals are in jail simply because they violated a, a state rule as opposed to violating an, you know, a longstanding ethical rule. So I, I know Tom has a lot to think about, our, a lot to say about our legal system and the criminal justice system in particular. Well, it seems that as the government grows larger and its ambitions grow greater, the list of things that you might do that w- it would consider – wrong or punishable by jail time would grow along with it. And so it's not just the drug war, which would be a case of a victimless crime, but also the huge regulatory thicket. It becomes impossible to know what I can do with my business, what I can't do. Antitrust law is impossible to figure out. But, you know, you know the old I – mean, I don't know if I can tell the joke, but I mean you could make a case under antitrust law that – Lowering your prices is wrong, raising your prices is wrong, and keeping your prices the same is wrong. So uh, that's sort of an administrative crime. And then we have people who just for no good reason just seem to enjoy – just enjoy lording it over people. And I was just talking to Ben Swan the other day about what's going on in Chicago where Rahm Emanuel is upset about electronic cigarettes where basically you're, you're exhaling vapor. Now, here we are in this world with every, you know, Dr. Paul's talking about all the things that are wrong in the world. <laughs> and he's worried about electronic cigarettes because the children might start smoking electronic cigarettes, even though the point of them is to help wean you off real cigarettes. It's not to get you to start smoking e cigarettes. And he wants to ban them, or you've got to go out on the street if you want to smoke them. So here you have people who are trying to quit smoking, and he's forcing them out there with the smokers. Like what – there, there's no secondhand effect of an e-cigarette. Like there's no conceivable health benefit. It's just they like doing this to us and these people are going to lecture us about the vices in our lives and yet the very first opportunity we ever have to peel back and look at the reality of their lives, we find out case after case after case they are involved in every conceivable vice under the sun. <laughs> Present company accepted. Okay, I know we got somebody else. Mike Clark? Oh, oh uh, just one, one yeah. short comment. I, I think the problem is, is that uh, 
these individuals who like legislation, they want to legislate against vices and bad habits. They should ever do that. You know, that's, that's not their business. But the other thing is, is the original intent was not to have a federal police force. And uh, so if there's going to be any of these laws, they should be legal. So I'm for, uh, you know, radically reducing the size and scope and authority of the federal government, and we might have a much better chance at handling this. But as Tom points out, the local people can be just as bad sometimes. But you can't, you can't have laws against vices and, and bad habits. That's just uh, – that's – totalitarian at the extremes. Quickly mention that Senator Dick Durbin and a bunch of similar creatures uh, wrote a letter to the, the uh, committee that puts on the, Os- the uh, Golden Globes and also warning the Oscars that they actually showed people smoking e- e-cigarettes on the air and this had to be banned. So they're already they're threatening them too. I, also, I just want to quickly mention uh, a great book by Harvey Silverglate who's a defense attorney in Boston called Three Felonies a Day. And he argues that just by living, you're committing three felonies a day. And it's, uh, it's, it's a good book. Well, attendance today is, is the fourth. So who do we got? Yeah, this I, gentleman in the deck tie. I'm a, a little bit confused about uh, the role of NSA and government and um, that in the grand scheme of fascism. Um, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders uh, made an inquiry and got back the word that Congress is being spied upon. Um, Whistleblower of nine years ago, Russ Tice, said he witnessed as NSA satellite um, intelligence analysts that U.S. senators, representatives, members of the administration, Obama, then unknown, um, uh, Supreme Court Judge Alito and many more were tapped. So this is not even close to the Patriot Act, I would say. Uh, suggestion is that maybe the NSA blackmails on what they know about members of government and at the, uh, at the, of the administration and Congress. So um, <clears throat> I know the, 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 the Soviets, uh, the Russians have it easy. They have uh, a KGB head and uh, he, is, he is going to be president. But um, so uh, in, in your analysis, um, is, is, is uh, the POTUS still... Obama, or is it uh, is there a co-president such as um, uh, Clapper, and and where does this fit into the grand scheme of fascism? Well, I, I want Dr. Paul to answer this one, but I've often wondered if the reason that Congress just uh, lamely gives up its prerogatives isn't necessarily just because they're a bunch of lazy bums, but because maybe there's some pressure being put on them behind the scenes. I mean, I I hate to even guess at something like that, given the wonderful people who are in charge just looking out for our good. But I wonder what Dr. Paul thinks. I think it's Dick Cheney. (laughs) He's into his fourth, no, he's into his fifth term. (laughs) I I don't think any of the presidents really are uh, in in charge. I think others are. (laughs) The people who provided the ability to get through the process and get through the, the media hurdles and get the money. Uh, and then they have a lot to say what's going on. And I think they also have a say on who becomes the Federal Reserve Board chairman, which is probably just as uh, significant as who is the president. <laughs> this young lady here. I have, I have a comment and then a question. Um, I grew up in a really small town, and my father's actually a police officer. And I've seen firsthand the militarization of the local police department in small towns. And because of a lot of the fear-mongering with the media, they almost welcome it. So what is the solution, other than the media is very biased, but a lot of Americans are aware of you know, the NSA problems and the, the police state that's emerging. But for a lot of people, like I said, they welcome it. So what is the solution and what, what practically can we do to get people to wake up? Well, there are some areas where I think we're doing pretty badly and other areas where I think things are turning around. And one of them is that the younger people, well, they might be confused on economics. Well, that's what the Mises Institute is here for. But they're much better on war and they're much more skeptical of the police. They don't buy into the superstitions of their parents. And I used to, by the way. I used to think that anybody who had any problem with the police was a pinko commie who should pack his bags and get on out of the good old USA. And now I see that I shouldn't have thought that way. 
But the younger people don't have some of the superstitions we have. And they're all – I mean Lou mentioned cop block. That's funny. I was just on their Facebook page a couple of weeks ago. They had about 73,000 likes. Then I checked the other day. They were at 94,000 likes. I mean like th- with that kind of growth, everybody would be a member of cop block by the end of this seminar. So, like, there are young people plus the ability to communicate forbidden ideas and videos and clips of what's really going on. So I don't know how this is all going to work out, but that is an explosive and very, very welcome combination. Anybody else want to? Okay. Where's our mic? Oh, it's this young man. Uh, Hello, my name is Anton Chamberlain. I go to Altoona High School in Georgia. And I know being the young age that I am, even I at times can be discouraged at times, you know, that things aren't necessarily going the way I necessarily want them to. And I was wondering how the three of y'all have been able to um, maintain your enthusiasm or been able to work through the adversities that have been given to you by the media blackouts and just the naysayers and the people that call you neo-confederates and uh, just how you've been able to work through those and maintain your sanity pretty much. Thank you. Well, right. well I mean, there's nothing to be dour about. I mean, we still have a level of material prosperity that we enjoy every day that no, generations before us never enjoyed. We still have a, a degree of freedom of speech and, and we have the digital age to allow us to communicate. But uh, I mean, lots and lots. We always, I think, have this this uh, sort of fantasy or that we uh, live in the most dangerous and dramatic times of all. And, and we're pikers compared to a lot of folks at a lot of different stages in history. So I, I, I still wake up with a smile on my face. And I, and I have two young children, so that's my motivator. Oh, we're not gonna, I, I want to jump in on that just sure. for a second. Uh, yeah, I've got a fifth child coming because our, our philosophy is we're just going to win the battle of ideas through sheer numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I mean, we should, in a way, we haven't got any, you know, anytime you're feeling down, you know, I want you to throw some cold water in your face, smack yourself around, and try and think about what it would have been like to be Murray Rothbard in 1967. The National Review crowd won't have anything to do with you, even though you're the, you know, next to Mises, the greatest living economist. The left, well, you can reach out a little bit to them, but increasingly less and less as the 60s go on. You are a free market economist who's anti-war. You could fit all of you in a phone booth. Remember those? And... Or, or Mises dies in 1973. Hayek gets the Nobel Prize the next year. Mises doesn't live to see it. And yet he just carries on, carries on, carries on. He doesn't get the feed. He can't send out a tweet and get 100 retweets instantly and be validated, right? And, and yet here we've got these tremendous advantages. We have the Mises Institute with a great reach, Dr. Paul with over a million likes on Facebook. We've got this ability to reach people that Rothbard and Mises could only have dreamed of, and yet they thoroughly enjoyed their lives. They didn't say, woe is me, and oh, things aren't going so well. I mean, compared to them, we've got it made in the shade. So smack yourself around if you're getting discouraged. You know, I get a similar question asked frequently. How did you survive all those years up there? Wasn't it really frustrating for you? And I said, no, I was never frustrated. Never once. I, just, I tell them I just had low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> But, but there's some truth to that is your expectations make a difference. You know, if I thought that, you know, me being in Congress, when I first went to Congress in 76, that I was going to uh, all of a sudden change that system. I think I understood it a little bit better than that. So I wasn't expecting to do that. Quite frankly, I think uh, more came of it than I ever dreamed because even after having been there for a long time, there's still, I think Jeff uh, might have mentioned that, you know, I would talk to smaller crowds well, for a long time. Uh, I would go to college campuses and get 15 or 20 people out and something, something changed in 07, all, all of a sudden, but things came together. So, uh, but in Washington, now I wasn't frustrated and I tried to make uh, the best of it and I really, really welcome a type of a victory. Uh, I, I remembered Leonard Reed's advice that, uh, you know, your approach has to be uh, to spread the message. It has to be, uh, you know, a much more calm demeanor. You don't grab a guy from the shirt and say, this is the way it is, and you're going <laughs> to listen to me. He says, uh, become knowledgeable. He says, somebody might ask you a question. 
And, and when they do, it's important. And I can remember, and many of you in this room will know the name of uh, uh, Walter Jones uh, from North Carolina. Walter Jones right now is probably the strongest anti-war uh, proponent in Washington. He's not a libertarian. He admits that. But he changed his mind on, on that. But I remember him coming, sitting down next to me. And uh, he was having second thoughts about why his, his voting for the war, and he wanted me to explain how you can be a conservative and be opposed to the war. And all of a sudden, light bulbs went on. So uh, for all the things that should have made me frustrated, a, uh, a Walter Jones and a couple others uh, gave me a lot of encouragement. And he came from a highly military district, right? He, he had no interest whatsoever in changing his mind. I'll just say for me, the, the, the two things that count are, first of all, we have the truth on our side. And uh, I think in, in a secular sense and in a religious sense, we know the truth will triumph. Also, it's fun to give the bad guys a hot foot. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's fun to fight them. So for me, those, those are the two things. Now, Lou, do you want to explain to our younger folks what a hot foot is? <laughs> I think that's another term like peace officer that we've... <laughs> Next question, who's up? Hello, my name is Chris Russell. I, I'd just like to get the panelists' opinion on the Free State Project, which for those of you who aren't familiar, is an effort to move 20,000 liberty-loving people to New Hampshire to uh, exercise liberty in our lifetimes. So I'm not a participant yet, but I'd just like to get your opinion on the Free State Project and also would you ever consider geographically the Mises Institute participating in or moving to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project? <laughs> Well, I, my mother was from New Hampshire. I spent a lot of time in New Hampshire as a kid. I love New Hampshire. And uh, I think the Free State Project is a very neat idea because it's being targeted, as Tom pointed out, by the police and the newspapers. And, but it's a, uh, I think it's terrific. For the Mises Institute, we have a wonderful – in fact, I want to invite everybody to come and visit us. We have a wonderful campus in Auburn. So that's not movable for, you know, for, for good or ill – we couldn't move it. Uh, on the free state movement, um, you know, I think it's fine, and I, I hope it works. Um, I probably wouldn't move to New Hampshire, you know. <laughs> I just wouldn't be in the cars. But the only way I see that it could be a shortcoming is I won. For all of us. I can't believe Woodsian is being used as a pejorative here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm Ken Hoover from Cypress, Texas. i got a question for Dr. Woods. Would you share briefly with this audience concerning the recent controversy with Mark Levin? Oh, I really don't want to, but only because you asked. Uh, nah, you know, there's this radio host, and I don't really want to dwell on him, but he wasn't particularly nice to our, our esteemed uh, friend and scholar here during the campaign. But uh, Mark Levin's a radio host. He's got eight gazillion listeners, and they're very loyal to him and good for him for that. And I don't bother with this guy. I don't listen to him. I don't respond to him, whatever, except when he attacks me or somebody else. Then I, I defend myself. And the thing is that then I defend myself and people say, Woods, why can't you just work together with Levin? And, well, do you ever say, Levin, why can't you work together? Like, why is it always me, right? I mean, I, I, I hope these, kids, these parents aren't teaching their kids, you know, if you're getting beaten up on the playground, why aren't you working together with that kid? Look, you've got to defend yourself sometime. And he was, he was saying terrible things about me, about Judge Napolitano. He wouldn't use the judge's name, but he would, he would call him Judge he, some bad name. And, like, we all know who he means. And I don't have time to make many YouTubes anymore because I'm, I'm recording videos on history and economics and government for a certain slave driver's homeschool curriculum over here. <laughs> so I, I don't have a lot of time, but, but it was only because I felt – there we go. It was only because – See, but that was a voluntarily agreed to whipping, so that's okay. <laughs> I don't have time, but I, I felt like I've got to. I know this sounds like melodramatic, but I thought like, lately he's been really attacking people who support state nullification. He says that you're kooks, you're crazy, but I have a pretty good argument for it, and he has not actually tried to address that. And I just thought, all right, I just can't let this go on without a response. So I made a response, and I told him, if you want to keep calling names, there's no way I can stop you. I've never called you a name. I said, none of the other people you're calling names have called you a name. And I even said, w we were probably raised differently from you, so that may have something to do with it. I said, but if you want to debate me anytime you want, 
you know, let's l- go ahead. You you name the place, and you and I will have a debate. And you know, I, I even was proposing judges who would determine a winner, and then we'll have a cash award for his favorite charity if I lose. And then if if uh, if I win, I have another charity, and he's not going to like giving money to it. So that's that. <laughs> You know, uh, somebody. I was talking to somebody once about being a uh, successful talk show host, and I thought that would be a neat thing to do. But I, I don't think that's, I'm cut out for that. I don't know whether you consider yourself a talk show host, but they told me how to be a successful talk show host and the many big shots in this country that are talk show hosts. And maybe they got, you know, to be uh, so big because they said a, a successful talk show host is somebody who can talk forever without saying anything. <laughs> Thank you. This gentleman's been very patient. My name is Israel Freeland. I'm out of Austin, Texas. And first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you for being here because it's not every day that you can sit amongst peers and heroes. That being said, I'm also appreciative that you mentioned uh, Sheriff Andy Griffith as well as the Tank Man. So much so that I have the Tank Man tattooed on the back of my leg. Yeah. <laughs> I'm currently over a decade in active duty with the military. I've been to the Balkans, I've been to Iraq, and being part of that, it's, it has its plus sides, and it, it, I feel more so its negatives. I still have about 18 months left in my current contract, and because so, I feel like I'm contractually obligated to be there. But I feel, too, while being there, I was able to mentor fellow soldiers so much so that they voted for Dr. Paul. And I see the militarization of our police force, where my own personal friend, Antonio Beeler, who was also a combat vet, who started the Peaceful Streets Project with the help of Pete from Cop Block. And I see what they're doing after the fact. And I, I, I see, especially like the APD, so much so trying to recruit from within the military while we're serving to go over there. And I feel like, well, how do you combat that? How do I join the APD too to hopefully try to influence and be a Sheriff Andy Griffith or do I continue along the road of filming police officers or do I attend these and try to pass that on to my children I guess I'm looking for some guidance because I feel that I am defeated where I feel like those small victories or those low expectations I don't, I don't know if it's enough right now Boy, that is a hard one. Well I know a lot of young people over the years have asked Ron what should they do I think it's a personal choice. Every individual has to make that choice. Uh, some people leave and get out of it and reject it. Uh, you're talking about being on active duty, mostly? Yes, sir. I had uh, a couple people on my channel the other day interviewed my husband and wife, and, uh, and they were really tired of it, and they declared themselves conscientious objectors. And uh, that's not advice because, uh, you know, and I referred to, you know, it, it, what they do is they get young people in. And when I was in, involved, in, there was a draft going on. And uh, though I didn't like what was going on, uh, you know, I wasn't ready to give up my medical career, my license, and, and fight the whole system. But, boy, I think it's personal. It's sort of like uh, uh, practicing civil disobedience. If you're doing peaceful civil disobedience, um, you might be arrested. You might have to go to jail. And some people make that decision. Others, uh, you know, aren't as likely to do that. But uh, if you make the best of a situation and think you can do something positive, uh, I, I don't think that's a terrible choice. Um, but... Um, Lawrence Vance, uh, it would be interesting to know what he would say. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it can be very tough. But it's, it's good that you're thinking about it, at least, at least that you have that, uh, that thought on your mind on trying to do the right thing. It would be nice if we had a website of testimonies from people who have been in your shoes or people who have transitioned out and what their experience was and what their advice is. Because I know there are a lot of them because I get emails from them. So that's a project for somebody to take on. Not me, of course. Somebody else. Well, I think we have time for two or three more quick questions. We have the gentleman visiting us from Austria. Well, from Los Angeles by way of Austria. Yeah, Nicholas Kimmler from Vienna originally. Uh, I have a question to you, uh, Mr. Dr. Paul. Um, It was a very hopeful and a very inspiring message you said. 
uh, if we look back to the Austrians, if we go back to Menger, if we go back to Böhm Barmberg, they all were very depressed about what happened, what they saw in the economical growth. Uh, Böhm Barmberg was even uh, saying to the emperor, if he's doing that, uh, we will see the collapse of the Austrian-Hungarian empire. Nobody was listening. What gives you the hope right now in all the challenges that we are facing, like in China, uh, there's an enormous uh, challenges in the next years coming that we will not have the same uh, uh, principles that they are happening again, what happened in the First World War or Second World War, that we really can break through, uh, that we all hope for, that uh, humankind is taking the next step of responsibility. Well, I'm hoping that we live in unique times and that uh, something very special is going to happen. Because right now, there's not a worldwide movement to promote uh, communism. You know, hopefully it's dead and buried, you know, in in the Marxist sense. And they had their experiment. The Nazis had their experiment. Uh, The fascists had their experiment. The Keynesians now, they're coming to an end. So I I think that uh, maybe the world does change. I I work on uh, a theory that, uh, you know, the human race has only been really active in promoting technology and all for uh, most of it. Most of the major changes have happened in like 200 years or so. But it's been around thousands of years, several thousands of years. But everything that we have done technologically, we have all this technology now, and the government's using it to spy on us. You know, and what about all the other technology? Yes, we have jet airplanes and we fly commercial. But uh, think of all the technology that's been used to just fight wars. So I, I really believe there could be a time where the, the hu- human the human being can change the mind and say, well, maybe we can get smarter, you know, and look at history, even though I know the natural tendency of evil people to do bad things. My goal is to explain why you want government so small that evil people can't get control of the government and the evil people be taken care of in your neighborhood. And hopefully we can move in that direction because of the obvious failure here. And that's why we have to capitalize on the Austrian theories coming about and being right and correct and have more credibility. At the same time, you can't be intellectually, although there's still some in our university, you can't be promoting Marxism, you know, and, and who, uh, I, I'm hoping that we can totally discredit Keynesianism, or they're going to discredit themselves, and therefore we might be able to usher in, an, in a new age. Okay, we have time for, always time for Don Prince. Dr. Don Prince. Well, thank you. I, we've talked many times about iconic picture of the tank man. Please go look at that picture because there's something even more wonderful in that. Look what he's holding in his hand. It's not a gasoline uh, bomb or anything like that. It's a shopping bag. (laughs) All right, let's have one last question. Hi, uh, my name's Jason Miller. I'm an Internet entrepreneur. I'm also a marijuana legalization activist. And uh, I'm involved with the Republican Party here in Harris County and recently began working with a group called RAMP, which stands for Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition. Um, We're in the process of forming an advisory board, and I'm curious if any of you or perhaps maybe colleagues that you know of would be interested in serving an advisory role. And do you think it's important to spread the message to conservatives that uh, medical marijuana, industrial hemp, and... Um, decriminalization, taxing and regulating marijuana like alcohol are important issues. Sure. Well, yes, you're addressing maybe some conservatives would come over and join, but I would have to suggest the progressives have not been very good at, uh, you know, moving along, even though they're supposed to have been, you know, and and, uh, Obama was supposed to lighten up. He's lightening up now, not because he's changed his mind, but because uh, the momentum is, is so great. But um, I, I look at it as, uh, you know, when we talk about the, the drugs, I talk, like I mentioned before, I talk about legalizing freedom, freedom of choice in all area. And I see uh, making your choice, <coughs> excuse me, your choice about marijuana equal to your choice about your spiritual life and your intellectual life, and it's all one and the same for me. Um, 
I don't know if I have. I mean, obviously everybody should hear this message, you know, conservatives, anybody else. But when you're when you're dealing in a political context, you're dealing with activists who have been around a long time and whose ideas are pretty well formed. It's not impossible they could change their minds, but it's highly unlikely. You know, it would be like the chairman of the Republican Party suddenly deciding that he wants to be a non-interventionist. Like that's just not going to happen, right? He he might be friendly or unfriendly to Dr. Paul, but he's that's that horse has left the stable. Like he he is who he is, and that's who he's going to be. So, uh, I mean, if it's aimed at trying to get up-and-comers who are young and don't have, any, don't have as many preconceived ideas and to say that you have a home here, well, that I think you're more likely to have success with. But uh, I, I think I would be more of a drag to your board than anything else, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause for our three speakers. <laughs> 